wisdom. So when we're um, dividing our experience and our thoughts up into the wholesome and the unwholesome, understanding which is which, that's one of the ways the Buddha defined wisdom. To have the wisdom to know. And, um, and then also, of course, right intention. So that we are, that's also wisdom. So right view, right intention. And now I'm going to talk about sila, which is the Pali word for virtue. And there are three uh, parts of the Noble Eightfold Path that are devoted to sila. It's extremely important. I was told that in the earlier days of Buddhism in America, people didn't want to pay much attention to this part. They wanted to just do meditation. And uh, as one monk said, it's, it's like loading up your boat and getting ready to row, and you, it's still tied to the dock. <laughs> Because without the moral virtue, uh, we can't really get very far. And that's because it's, um, it's not just about what we do to other living beings, which is, of course, where morality is happening. And also, uh, that's where we make karma. Karma is with other beings. Um, it's also what it does to the mind. That's, that's the car. It makes a, an impression on the mind or the mental stream or the karmic stream or the energy stream, consciousness stream, whatever you, however you want to think about it. So the three aspects of sila that the Buddha included in the Noble Eightfold Path are right speech, right action, and right livelihood. So right speech has four parts, as I mentioned this morning. It's to tell the truth. Um, when we understand the impact on our mind of not telling the truth, we would never want to fudge on that again. And it also has an impact on the way we're received in the world because then people can trust us. It's really great living in a community of people who all have that um, vow because you know they're never going to lie to you. It's really uh, powerful, supportive. So telling the truth, of course, uh, includes uh, being careful about not exaggerating, um, um, I think that you know, a person can generally tell the truth, but they might stretch things a little. So it's good to look at that. And the practice that I used to clean that up for myself was that whenever I was talking and what I was saying didn't really match what had happened or what um, I was really thinking or feeling, then I would just stop and I would say, no, wait a minute, that's not quite right. And I would go back and I would say it more clearly, correctly, more truthfully. And that was a really, really useful practice. So it just, it's like making the mind go back and do it right. And uh, it reminded me of uh, watching a steeplechase. I don't know if you've ever um, watched this kind of horse race, but it's, it's like the, the horses run 
individually through a course that goes over hedges and water jumps and you know all kinds of things and and they're timed and the the rider um, you know goes through this course with the horse as fast as they can of course to win the race but if the horse doesn't take the jump and they just stop veer away or whatever um, you would think that the rider would just walk off the field you know just ride off the field but he, he doesn't he takes the horse around and they do the jump and complete the course and I realized how important that was for training and so I, I do that for myself. If I, you know, it's like instead of just um, saying something that isn't true, quite true, and letting it go to come back around and say it um, correctly really helps to make the mind more, um, more clear and it imprints that honesty and that desire for honesty on the mind and, and um, it feels good. So um, there can be these various situations where people are tempted to lie, you know, especially if something's embarrassing or they might, they feel like they might hurt someone else. But it never pays off, really. Um, sometimes we have to be more creative, creative with our silence, perhaps, um, and with our sincerity of how we actually feel about a situation. But I would encourage as much um, introspection and uh, deliberate attention to this factor as possible so that you never have to feel like you're being shady and no one ever has to feel like they can't trust you. And then there's uh, the aspect of right speech that's around harshness. Um, there's four parts. Harshness or, or roughness of speech is one of them. Divisive or malicious speech is, is different. Uh, so those two, so not saying things that will divide people. Instead, saying things that unite people, that bring peace to situations. And um, instead of saying things in harsh ways um, to be as kind as we can, as um, gentle as we can. And having said that, sometimes the Buddha would say things that seemed quite harsh. You foolish person, how could you do that? But as far as I can tell, those were always his students, the people who had committed to training. And so, you know, it's, it's like, it's important, it is important to let people know um, if you're responsible for that, let them know when they're doing things that are hurting them and wrong. Um, the Buddha said that there are five parts to, um, well, he ta he's, sometimes he talks about three parts or four parts, but the five part version I think is, is the most complete so when you speak, make sure that what you say is true and say it from a heart of loving kindness, not from a heart of inner hatred. So if we're having a problem with someone, it takes some work sometimes to get to that place where it comes from kindness and not from malice or hatred or um, wanting to hurt them or just push back. And um, say it gently rather than harshly. And 
make sure that what you're saying has a purpose, has a good purpose behind it. Because he said, even if it's something that you know is true, even if it comes from a heart of loving kindness, if it's not going to serve a good purpose, don't say it. And then the fifth thing is say it at the right time. So we may have to say something that's true, has a good purpose. Um, we say kindly and, and with a heart of loving kindness, but the person won't want to hear it. And you have to say it at a time when they're most likely to be able to hear it. And then the Buddha said, if they don't want to hear it, if they don't like hearing it, then it, that's okay. There's not, you, you can't, you, sometimes you have to say things. Um, it's not about whether or not people like what you say or approve of what you say. It's about whether or not someone who's wise would approve of what we say. And this is really interesting. It's like we worry so much about what other people think, or at least a lot of us do. And most of those people aren't very wise, the ones we're looking for approval from. So it's like um, thinking about the people who really are um, in touch with the way things actually are and are wise and care about what they think. And then the, the fourth of the right speech components, I hope this isn't getting too uh, complicated, <laughs> but you know, five, five aspects of, right, of, of, of a particular um, thing we're gonna say, but the noble um, um, factor of right speech has these four aspects, being true, being um, not harsh, um, being not divisive, and not trivial. So it comes back to that, you know, like having a good purpose, not trivial isn't quite the right word, um, gossipy or frivolous or it's the kind of speech that just wastes people's time or pulls their mind off of what's important onto you know, junk. Um, there's a lot of this in social media, for example. Um, and the Buddha didn't include in this um, cordial and amiable talk, he would say. You know, like you, you greet someone, you ask them how they are, there's, you know, there's some amount of bonding through talking about things, but that's not the same as like talking about stuff that just kind of like revs up the mind or distracts it or pulls it away, um, adds more noise. Um, gossiping about people is, you know, uh, hugely entertaining for people sometimes, but it's detrimental to the mind and it's detrimental to relationships. So it's, it's in it really kind of baffled me that you know like right and the and the bhikkhuni the sister i live with she's like like why is frivolous speech in the in the top 10 like there's killing and then there's frivolous speech i mean <laughs> so what i can say about it is that i think it's because there's so much importance the buddha plays so much importance on the mind and what we're doing with the mind and that we want to purify it. So the last thing we kind of want is to dump a bunch of junk into it. It's like kind of dumping junk into your drinking water. You know, it's just not really a good idea. So that's right speech. And um, as I mentioned, sometimes the best option is silence. And actually, as we think about silence, it's good to get a sense of how, um, how we feel about being silent and how it feels to be in a silent environment or to be silent with someone else. And just notice how the mind does with that. 
if it's okay and if it's not okay to have silence then why what's going on it's worth reflecting so right action very clearly defined around the first three precepts not killing not stealing and not engaging in sexual misconduct so intentional killing of living beings is pretty straightforward and if you've ever run into the restatement of the precepts in the positive I don't know if you have where they say instead of avoiding killing that you um, like uh, treat all beings with loving kindness or what other ways do they do the positive like uh, cherish life thank you well there's nothing wrong with cherishing life that's for sure however in terms of a precept how do you know if you're succeeding or not and that's the trouble with turning it into the positive how much cherishing of life does one need to do whereas if you're intentionally killing any living being you know that it's clear you get to the end of your day and you know if you've intentionally killed something or not this is true with lying too the Buddha said that a lie is something you know you're gonna lie and you lie it's it's like yes if you if you make a mistake we need to clean that up too but it's like there's a lot around intention and the clarity of the mind um, if we're doing things that we're unclear about that's also a problem <laughs> but but the uh, to think in terms of really wanting to um, avoid killing and that that's your intention and there's no intention to kill now when I start talking about intention then you might think the automatic swatting of the mosquito is not intentional but actually it is you do have a choice there it's just that we get into habits that cause us to lose track of the fact that we have will involved and we need to slow that down and see where the choice point is um, as one teacher I heard uh, say that you know you think that when we get angry that the anger flares up and we just automatically blast or do whatever it is and it's like it's not true there is there is choice in there it's there is a moment when you decide to go with it and that we need to recognize that that's within our control it may take work and time to unpack the habit pattern and change it but we can and that's part of our responsibility so um, with right action, not killing and not stealing, not taking anything that isn't offered to us, it's definitely a cut above stealing um, because it's, it's like to know this is meant for me. Um, the tea was offered. Um, I don't mean you have to be like a monk or a nun and make sure somebody puts it all in your hands, but you know, we know whether it's meant for us or not. Um, I had one, one uh, person who was coming to our place who was started keeping the precepts and she was uh, a person who waters plants at, at um, company offices and she said there was one office where they said to her now whenever you come help yourself to a drink in the refrigerator and, and she wouldn't always just do that automatically. They'd say, go, go get your, your drink. And, you know, you knew that that was offered. She knew. And there'd be other places, you know, there's a bowl of candy there on the counter. And she's like, no, no, that's for the, the clients, not for the plant watering lady, unless they say, right? And so it's a small, you think, oh, that's a small thing. But the mind gets so clear and so... Um, it's like um, so pure 
that we just, we just don't have to regret anything. Um, there's a, a quality there that actually brings more than we think it would to have that kind of clarity, clarity and purity in our, in our life. And then sexual misconduct, I don't know why uh, it so often seems so muddy. Maybe because in the suttas, in the, the scriptures, it's, very, it's totally male-oriented. It's just speaking to men about their sexual misconduct. And it's very cultural. So it doesn't even say um, that a man shouldn't have sex outside his rela- primary relationship because there was a lot of, you know, having more than one wife and all of that. Although the Buddha did talk about that in other places, that to have a good, a good marriage, you need to be faithful to each other. So the way I feel about sexual misconduct. Since I had a lot of lay life before becoming a nun, I feel like I have some experience in this. It's really about not using sexuality in any way that would be harmful to yourself or to someone else. And that certainly includes being involved with someone who's got a partner or being involved outside your own relationship if you're committed to someone that causes a lot of pain and um, when I was unmarried and um, you know once in a while would run into someone who wanted to get involved and said "Uh, my my wife is completely fine with this I said let's call her Are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> anyway, you get the point. <laughs> um, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I've had a couple of different people over the years come to me and talk to me about feeling like they wanted to get involved with someone who's married and not sure what they should do and I'm like I'm sure what you should do do not do it no and and they'll come back to me years later and go I'm so glad you were so clear (sighs) you (laughs) saved me from a lot of trouble sexual desire is so strong and so tricky and so sticky human beings will risk their lives even when their life is on the line to have sex with someone they're not supposed to have sex with. What are we thinking? (laughs) I know what we're thinking. (laughs) But it's like really examining desire, really looking at um, what lies behind it really looking at what we really want in our life, what we really want our minds to be like, what we really want um, our relationships to be like. Because if you want to be happy and free, to walk this path to full liberation, that kind of stuff is going to have to stop. And all the rest of it, anything that falls into the dingy category (laughs) we have to set aside and following sensual desire um, becomes less and less and less appealing less and less interesting and we see the danger in it much much more clearly as we develop the mind and really experience the unworldly pleasure of spiritual development, awakening. It's so much better than anything sensual. 
Now, having said that, we've also all done things. And I can say this from experience, and I can say it from like um, one of my teachers in Thailand. He said, we've all done things. But he said, when you, when you look at the past, just cut it off. He did this like, just cut it off. Don't, don't worry about what you did before. What matters is what we do now and forward. And we learn from the things from the past, acknowledge it, forgive ourselves, everyone else, and move forward with a whole new agenda, the one that's about purifying the mind and being really safe. Ourselves, we're safe, and every living being in the world is safe around us. This is an incredible gift. And this is what the Buddha said. And when we keep moral virtue, we are giving this incredible gift to every living being, a gift of safety. No one ever has to worry about their stuff around you. No one ever has to worry about their partner or their child around you. No one ever has to worry about themselves around you you're safe. What a great thing. And even if we don't know how it works, because we're that way, we are also safe. And I don't mean that nothing ever happens. No one's ever violent with someone who's living in such a way, but there's a part of you that no violence could ever touch that purity of your mind. So an innocent person gets killed. That's not such a big deal. I'm sorry. <laughs> sounds maybe sounds insensitive, but that's not how I mean it. I'm I'm not worried about the innocent person. I'm worried about the one who's not. It's really bad for the person who's doing the killing, but it's not so bad for the person who dies because they're going on in a good way. Um, we always want to preserve life. It's not taking it lightly, but where do we go from here? Everyone's going to die. We're all going to die, and we're going. It's not the end, in case you haven't, you know, kind of felt that yet it's not the end and what we do with our morality sets our course beyond this life and we have choices about that right now which direction we're going and so it's it's in every small choice that we purify the mind, that we set our course, our direction for what's wholesome and peaceful, and it changes our character. Our character develops. So you can look back over the years after making this kind of decision and really feel good. Or you can look back over the hours after making this kind of decision and feel really good. Every day when you get ready to go to sleep at night, you can reflect, I didn't intentionally kill any living beings today. I didn't intentionally take anything that wasn't meant for me. I didn't impose on anyone with my sexual energy. And that's good can be happy about that. Everyone that I encountered all day long was safe around me. What a great thing. And then your boat can 
pull away from the dock. Your boat of mindfulness and samadhi, concentration. It's got a chance. <laughs> and your wisdom develops more as you're utilizing it, refining it. Your virtue gets clearer and clearer, and the mind is happy, more stable, less drama, and less trauma. So I think what's wonderful about it is that we um, have this agency, our own um, ability to choose. And even if you feel like, like I said before, if there is some really strong pattern, that can also be changed. It needs to be made conscious. And then, step by step, it changes. I guess the first thing is to really recognize that there is no benefit whatsoever in any kind of cheating, in any kind of um, behavior outside of these um, beautiful precepts. We're missing so much if we don't follow this, and we're not going to miss anything if we do. That um, comes from the voice of experience of not just me, but the Buddha also. 